On the next Probably True Solar Stories, we continue with part two of The Red Knight and the Dawn of the Solar Dragon. Gorin the Red Knight has invented a technology to replace clean dragon power with short-sighted fossil fuel power. But can Gorin replace a fire-breathing dragon without getting burned and starting the second dragon war? Welcome back to Season 2, Episode 9 of Probably True Solar Stories. I'm your Solar Story host, Tor Solarfred Falenza. So far, we've had eight episodes of Solar Noir Stories in Season 2, and this one may be our darkest. Especially if you have a love for fire-breathing, lie-detecting energy dragons that have a taste for chocolate-covered aardvarks. Confused? That's probably because you didn't listen to Part 1. Go back and listen to episode 8. I promise you, part 2 needs that context. As always, you can read the true solar takeaways in the show notes. They separate this story's solar fact from solar fiction. Okay, here we go. The Red Knight and the Dawn of the Solar Dragon Part 2 was written and read by Tor Solar Fred Valenza. Now that the Red Knight had invented a technology for replacing energy dragons, the next task was to quietly replace those dragons. As mentioned, dragons were generally tame, but they were not dumb. With their innate lie detection, they couldn't be persuaded to leave their caves on false pretense. You couldn't say, you're fired, either. Oftentimes, we'd built boiler kettles in the dragon's home cave, so they'd have nowhere to go and would more likely put fire to the messenger. More troubling was dealing with Belt. The dragons had joined the Brotherhood of Elvish Laborers and Trolls, or Belt Union. The current contract had a twenty-year term with twelve years remaining. King Maxwell had insisted on the long-term contracts so that the kingdom's accounting wizards could set utility rates based on the levelized cost of dragons, otherwise known as the LCOD. If Gorn went into a cave and said, You're fired to any Union energy dragon, that dragon would cite the twenty-year Union contract and ask about cause. Then an elf union captain would be called, and if there weren't cause as defined by section 3b paragraph 7, the elves would call for a general dragon strike. Not only would there be a blackout, but the elves and trolls would also go on strike, shutting down the kingdom's breweries, distilleries, and troll replies on social media. Worse, once the dragons learned that old King Maxwell had broken their twenty-year contract without cause, That would be a lie. Not only would there be an immediate kingdom-wide blackout, it would cause another dragon war. For these reasons, King Maxwell authorized the dragons to be extinguished quickly and quietly. But how? Gorin knew that the attack had to be a surprising head-on assault with armor that could withstand dragon fire. After the dragon was slain, They could even burn their tough, scaly corpse in the upgraded energy boilers. The Belt Union and other dragons would assume that the deceased dragon had flown away on vacation, or just got pissed off and left. Rare, but plausible. As for a quick head-on attack, it was impossible with conventional weapons and armor. A knight wearing the king's normal steel armor would face a dragon flame that would bake and boil the knight like a sack of meat in an iron sous-vide. Targeted, heated dragon breath would also melt a steel shield as quickly as ice cream on a hot tar road. What the Red Knight needed was some kind of fire-resistant metal. Gorin tried to ask me if I knew of such metal, but I told him I could not think of one, though really I could. It's easy to lie to a human. Had Esther asked me the same question, I would have told her that only millennium could, for a short time, reflect a burst of dragon fire. It also made an excellent arrowhead for piercing through the throats of dragons. I don't know how Gorin found the right answer. A dragon alchemist would have known why Gorin had asked the question, and he also would have known the value of the right answer. 
I do wonder if Gorn had paid the alchemist his price or killed him right after he learned about millennium. In any case, millennium was a very rare earth material, but with the king's credit card at his disposal, it was easy for the Red Knight to source and craft 500 suits of millennium armor and 10,000 millennium arrowheads and an equal number of harpoons. Ironically, the dragons unknowingly provided the intense thermal heat that crafted the millennium shields and the weapons that would soon wage war against them. Dun. La, 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 la. With the Millennium Arsenal warehoused in the Light Palace, Goran chose his Red Knight Brigade from convicted murderers who had already been sentenced to death. Fighting dragons was like a death sentence, but Goran promised them full pardons and freedom if they survived. You have to remember that Millennium was a new material. In theory, it could deflect extremely high temperatures, but no one knew its limits. Dragon breath could be fired at temperatures ranging from 100 degrees Fahrenheit to a white-hot and disintegrating 10,000 degrees. Thus, the shields and arrows needed to be tested. Goran knew better than to test his millennium on me and Esther. We were well guarded, not just by my inventions, but also the location of our dragon cave. It was like a castle on a mountain. To attack us, the Red Knight Brigade would have to climb 4,000 stairs and surely be boiled in Esther's dragon fire after the first hundred steps. Instead, Goran chose to attack Alex Therma Dragon, King Maxwell's dedicated energy dragon for the Luxenshire Light Palace. A palace dragon engineer later told me about the details of the attack. It's painful for me to imagine what he described. I'd known Alex since he was a hatchling. He grew up to be huge. One small burp from Alex's firebox could boil water in less than a second. His twin brother Adam served as the king's pika dragon and was even larger. Being one of only two palace dragons made Alex feel very proud and, I suppose, too secure. On one of Alex's last coffee breaks, we met to catch up. He'd grown to the size of a humpback whale. Seeing his size, I called him fat and lazy. This was an honest judgment, not a lie, and he took it well. He said, I may be fat, but I'm not lazy, tiny Zeno. I work as directed. Has the king ever had a blackout in this last year? Nope, because when King Maxwell needs fire for energy, he relies on Alex the Great Fat and Lazy Dragon. Ha, ha, ha. We laughed together and I don't know if Alex ever laughed again. I'm sure Alex heard the train arrive and break outside the dragon power cave. Dragons can hear like bats. Make a little noise and the sound wave will reveal the object's shape and size. So he must have heard Gorn and the clanking footsteps of the Red Knight Brigade, and when they came closer, he must have seen them too. But why didn't he shoot his whitest flame? That I can't understand. The only explanation I can think of was that Alex didn't understand that he was being betrayed. It was that moment of confusion and disappointment that must have been his undoing. I'm told that ten millennium crossbow arrows and a harpoon pierced Alex's throat. After that, if he did cast a flame, it sprung out of his wounded throat like a flaming necklace. After Alex was dead, Gorin turned to Adam King Maxwell's backup Pika dragon and Alex's twin brother. I'm told he was sleeping in the cave, and I'm glad it was fast. If he'd woken up to learn of King Maxwell's betrayal and sensed his twin's corpse, he would have not died in peace. Without dragons, the light palace went dark that night. But the king knew it would happen. In half a night, Goran had jerry-rigged his upgrades into the kettle boiler and loaded it with clear-cut timber for burning. Hours later, he experimented with oil, coal, and gas. The palace light stayed on, and Gorin instantly knew that he could now replace every energy dragon in the kingdom by digging, drilling, burning, and by the murder of dragons. As for the bodies of Alex and Adam, they also proved to be energy fuel. They were difficult to alight and didn't burn efficiently, but packed with enough red-hot coal they eventually turned to ashes. 
Having solved all of his bottlenecks, Gorn the Red Knight and his brigade of murderers began to replace dragons throughout the kingdom's grid. Power plant by power plant, Gorn repeated his murderous dragon upgrades after dark. Within a fortnight, half of the energy dragons had been replaced. It was only when the skies began to be gray with the smoke of burning timber, coal, and oil that people and dragons began to wonder about the new stench and color of the kingdom's air. No one had ever seen energy exhaust air before. Was it always gray? The surviving dragons knew what had changed before the humans. They not only smelled the burning fuel, they smelled the flesh of burnt dragons. Like Alex, some didn't want to believe the smell came from humans betraying them. Perhaps there'd been a dragon fight. That often caused fire wounds and dragon flesh. Those optimists died quickly. For those dragons who knew the betrayal was real, they came out of their caves and left the dragon energy plants, destabilizing the grid and causing kingdom-wide darkness. As for their Belt Union brothers and sisters, Gorin and his Red Knight Brigade confronted their leaders. They said that if they could slay dragons, imagine what they could do to elves and trolls. Besides, if everyone could one day install solar panels on their roofs and get free energy from the sun, the Union would lose all of its coal mining and drilling jobs. Gorin also promised that if solar and batteries ever did mature, that the king would pass decrees that would maintain their energy monopolies and prioritize large-scale solar. That would maintain the Belt Union's hold on energy labor. Also, the elves and the trolls reasoned that dragons were only animals. And so, the elves and trolls stood down, and they did not go on strike. As for Esther, she quickly sensed the culling and knew that it had to do with the Red Knight but she didn't know if I was involved. Zeno, what have you done? She asked after smelling the air's singed dragon skin. It was a gentle question, perhaps disappointment more than accusation. I haven't done anything, Esther. She knew it was true. I'd never lied to her or any dragon in my entire life. Esther nodded, accepting my answer. Gordon has come for his revenge, she said. I can smell the air. It's dirty and filled with the burnings from earth and dragon flesh. I don't understand. The king said that Gorn was building coal-powered railroads, I said. Dragons were never a good fit for railroad steam engines. They were too large, preferred to fly, and they often got carsick. Gorn was a natural scientist and engineer, so I thought this new railroad career was reasonable. I couldn't conceive that he or King Maxwell would move forward on his fossil fuel energy plants without letting me know. Esther remained patient with my gullibility. Gorin is not building passenger railways, Zeno. He's been quietly replacing dragons by stripping the earth and burning natural fuel so that you humans can have your lights and coffee makers and video screens. A daft plan, but one with great royal profits, I expect. The moment she explained it, I knew it was true. Dragons never lie, even to themselves. I'm sorry, Esther, I said. In the two years that Gorn had implemented his fossil energy upgrade plan, I had made great progress with my solar cell technology, and Petrov was close to perfecting his lithium-iron phosphate battery power as well. Wind power was also coming into its own. Another energy wizard was working with iron air formulas for long duration and seasonal energy storage. Hydroelectric dams and geothermal power stations were also being piloted. In short, our energy wizards were close to making clean energy reliable and inexpensive, and King Maxwell knew it. After all, I reported to him every month, but clearly he wanted to maintain his monopoly and control of electric power. Esther and I could hold a press conference and announce our clean energy progress, but we both knew it wouldn't stop Gorn and the King from their current plans. In fact, I expected that Gorn and his Red Knight Brigade would target the clean energy wizards after they'd extinguished the dragons. They would say that our experiments were failures or not quite ready to scale. 
I look to Esther. I'm not a general, but I am a natural wizard. Ask me what you need to defend yourself, and I shall create it. I don't know yet, said Esther. I'm going to gather the dragon survivors, and then we're going to fight. I suppose you could invent a way to protect us, to fight back. I will, as fast as I can, I said. Esther looked back at her cave and then to me. One more thing, Zeno. If you can, protect my eggs. There are five of them. If you can keep them warm, they'll be pipping and hatching soon. But don't you crack them, Zeno. Let them come out naturally. I will, and I'll put a dragon fire blanket on them. That should keep them warm. If I don't come back, hide them, and help them live. You have my word, I said. As a dragon, she knew I meant it. Then Esther stood up fifty feet high and stretched her wings. They were as broad as the width of two railroad cars. She turned, and I watched her take four giant clawfoots forward to the cave's mouth. Her powerful back legs dug into the dragon landing pad, and there was a huge push of air as Esther flapped and leaped. Chunks of dragon landing pad concrete cracked and broke like eggshells as Esther's claws rose out of the cave's opening and disappeared. That was the beginning of the Second Dragon War. In many ways it was a human civil war. There were those like me that wanted to protect the dragons and pay them for their natural abilities to heat boilers, and there were those who considered dragons a burden on the economy. On Luxentia News tonight, Gordon and King Maxwell told the pundits that they would and could defeat the dragons. Asked if it was morally right to do so, the king replied that the gods had given humans a bottomless supply of fossil energy fuel. Moreover, Previously fallow and unused land was being sold and put to use. Jobs were being created, and taxes were being collected for the good of all. Of course, a switch to solar, wind, and clean energy would also create hundreds of thousands of new jobs, but the king wouldn't say that on the program. Instead, in dramatic and scripted theater, Gordon stripped off his millennium armor and showed the audience his red chest. He said that energy dragons like Esther were dangerous. Not only were dragons greedy for gold, but they wanted to burn and injure. It was time for these energy thieves to be extinguished before they ruined our economy at best and broiled our children at worst. Following that appearance, King Maxwell distributed millennium arrows to every household. In a famous speech, he said that the only way to defeat a bad dragon was with a good human with a crossbow. The king then announced a bounty of one hundred gold pieces for every dragon head. Over the next month, the Red Knight continued to appear on cable shows, spreading lies that energy dragons were hungry for the tender flesh of children. They no longer wanted to be paid in gold and chocolate aardvark benefits. Instead, they wanted ten children per hour to continue heating the kettles. Many doubted this story, especially when the king forbade the networks from interviewing dragons or me. Everyone knew that dragons were harmless unless you lied to them. Feeling that they were losing public opinion, King Maxwell ordered Gorin to capture ten poor children playing in the forest. He caged them and set them on fire until their flesh was crisped. Then he wrapped their black skeleton corpses in white sheets and unfurled them at the light palace square. It was strange that people couldn't see through the lie. If the dragons had actually done this terrible deed, the children would have been eaten. Also, dragons generally liked their prey to be medium rare. But the dragons couldn't defend themselves. They were still censored on television. And so, everyone now believed Gorin and the king's lies. Parents took up millennium shields, arrows and swords, and searched every cave for sleeping dragons. It was relatively easy to find them. Black rings of dragon soot usually marked the edges of their sleeping caverns. A good crossbow hunter could pierce their throat with three or four arrows. Then, as the dragon awoke in confusion, another human could use a millennium sword for decapitation. Hearing of these late-night attacks, the dragons flew to Makido, their ancient home cave that was hidden from all creatures except dragons. It was said that the first dragons emerged from Makido 
and when dragons were in distress, they returned there for strength and community. Esther told me later that there were maybe one hundred dragons who had somehow escaped from Gorin and the bounty hunters. Some arrived at Makedo wounded but alive, their throats boiling for revenge. After several days of recovery and planning, Esther addressed the survivors. We gave humans the power of light with our fire, said Esther. Now we bring them back to darkness. Esther had a simple plan. Destroy the power plants. Turn off the lights, no more dishwashers. And certainly, no more jacuzzis. Oh boy, can you imagine a world without lights, dishwashers, and jacuzzis? Well, if you can't, tune in to part three when we start our energy dragon war. Of course, no war is pleasant or easy, as Esther quickly finds out. But rest assured, solar power comes to the rescue. This is a probably true solar story, after all. Find out how next week. And by the way, if you were one of those first people who listened to part one of this story, you might have heard me say that this story was a two-parter. You must have imagined that. Either that, or I cut out where I said that in part one, and split this epic solar dragon story into three even parts. But probably you imagined it, because I would never edit a podcast that I've already published. No, not me. Heaven forbid. If you're enjoying Probably True Solar Stories, the most important thing you can do to support the show is to share these episodes with friends and family interested in solar, clean energy, audiobooks, and especially those thinking about transitioning their careers to solar. Of course, a generous review on Apple or Spotify will also help spread the word. For corporate sponsors, head over to probablytruesolar.com and send me a message. The Red Knight and the Dawn of the Solar Dragon was written and read by me, Tor, Solar Fred Valenza. Probably True Solar Stories is a production of Unthink Solar, PR, and Communications. Be bold for solar, stand out, and educate. See you next week.